All right. I think we can get going, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are at. Uh, my name is Kim Opelt and I'm going to be your host today um, for an important discussion on mitigating learning loss. We'll be going over um, four considerations for K-12 schools and then have a great panel. Um, so just going to go over the agenda really quick for today. Um, we are going to start out by telling you a little bit about class. We are going to go through some background and strategies on learning loss and recovery. And then the bulk of our time is actually going to be set, spent with our panelists. Um, and we would definitely love for you to join the conversation. So if you have any questions for our panel as we go, um, definitely add them to the Q&A section of your Zoom platform. Here's a little preview of our panel today. I am so excited to welcome um, these three outstanding people. I feel very lucky to be doing so. Um, Janice Case is the director, the California director of the National Center on Education and the Economy. We also have Danielle Jastro, who is a school counselor in Richfield Public Schools in Minnesota. And finally, um, Lauren Young is the director of mathematics at the School District of Philadelphia. So thank you all so much for being here and, um, and we'll get you in the conversation in just a minute. So before we dig into um, a little bit on the learning loss research, I wanted to take just a quick minute to introduce you to class. Um, over the past year, schools have year more and um, schools have really transitioned to online learning and it has definitely presented some obstacles. So to provide for a more engaging experience, we at CLASS have taken the tools that you already know and use in Zoom, and we've added even more interactivity to them. So educators can take attendance, they can hand out assignments, give quizzes, um, grade work, and then even meet one-on-one -on -one with students or families through the CLASS platform. So if you want to learn any more about class, we are happy to talk you through it. Go visit our website at class.com and we'll have some more information at the end as well. So let's get started. Um, let's talk about the challenge of learning loss. So it's definitely not a new concept. Learning loss is um, has been around for a while and um, it it is really just emerged and, and been a hot topic um, and a major concern in K-12 education over especially the past 14 months. So as so many schools have pivoted to learn from, um, or as so many students have pivoted to learn from their own home, um, obstacles have definitely arisen and their emotional support and their educational support system turned virtual. And because of that, a multi, um, underrepresented students and minority students were um, un unfortunately most affected by this. So learning loss can occur due to a variety of reasons. Um, students can become less engaged due to their learning setting. They can have um, a lack of individual attention in both synchronous and asynchronous courses. Um, access to broadband hasn't been available to everyone, and we've definitely seen that as an obstacle. And because parents are often working during the day, we've seen that students have um, a lower level of supervision uh, than they would obviously in the in-person classroom. So as educators, I know it's been a struggle to address various learning styles and, um, and provide individual feedback online. And you can't teach students if they don't show up. So obviously if students are absent or truant, they are losing out on, on learning for that period of time. And um, I want to also say, make no mistake, this is not the, uh, the fault of the teachers, of counselors, of district leaders and families who are working night and day over time um, to address this. Um, it's, it's just been the perfect storm that has been really exasperated by um, an already emerging issue. So the concept of, of learning loss has also caught the attention of the Department of Education. So in the recently passed American Rescue Plan, 20% um, of funding going to schools and districts must be spent to address that learning loss. So what can we, what can we do about it? Already we've seen educators working hard to address student needs. So both academically, socially, emotionally, mentally, and, um, and to help provide the resources that help bridge that digital divide. Um, we've, 
seeing them work to engage families even more, to build in even more feedback loops, and to establish um, student accountability. So I wanna just really quickly pause for a poll. And as you think about learning loss in your own institution, um, your district, your school, what do you see as the greatest barrier? All right, we'll give you just one more minute. Looks like, yep. So it's coming up, it looks like student burnout or lack of engagement is the, um, is the, is the leader here. And, um, and definitely exactly what we've been seeing kind of across the board as well. Um, engagement is key, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, too, as we go along. So let's take a look at some of, um, some of the considerations that schools and districts are taking a look at when they think about learning recovery and learning loss in their schools. So one tactic to address kind of the onslaught of learning loss is to enhance summer programming. And instead of just providing credit recovery programs, which is what we've seen a lot um, in the past related to summer programs, um, it's time to take a look at the holistic needs of all of the students, um, many who have been isolated for the past year. So when you're working on, on your summer programs, consider adding programs that address non-cognitive skills and also that those that kind of enhance the um, or reinforce the basics of, um, of the academic um, platform that, that students have been going off of. So they may need a refresh in that area and, um, and just personalizing summer learning to help students feel confident as they start the year off, um, the new school year off is going to, um, to, to be beneficial to all, I think. Um, as you probably know, many districts scrambled to get devices and software into the hands of students last spring. So now is a great time to take a look at um, the tools that students and teachers and counselors and administrators have and assess what we can do to continue to enhance that learning and teaching experience. So even though many students are returning to the classroom, we I don't think we'll ever abandon the online teaching experience. So whether it's to address absences or snow days, to establish um, virtual academy, which we're seeing across the board, or even just to make family meetings more accessible. I think this technology is really here to stay. So um, many resources have been available through ESSER and GEAR funds, and, um, and we're seeing that it's a great opportunity to ensure students and staff have the tools, um, both hardware and software, to be digitally connected throughout the entire school year, no matter where they're learning from. And then, although we did see an influx of um, learning loss last year, there were some students that actually thrived in that distance learning environment. Um, and because of this, I think students are going to be returning to the school year with a variety of skills and needs, both academically um, and personally. So with the technology that we've had and the lessons we've learned, uh, personalized learning will definitely be more important than ever. So um, I think using personalized evaluation, feedback, and then even differentiated assessment, students can really leverage their learning styles to succeed in the way that works for them. And then the final theme I wanted to highlight to encourage learning recovery is really to focus in on student engagement. So as we work to build and um, continue to try to improve that virtual classroom experience, one thing we've learned is that engagement is key, <laughs> just as the poll outlined. If students are engaged, um, they're more likely to come to class. They're more likely to participate in class. And then they're more likely going to succeed. So I would look at engagement not as an invisible concept. Um, it can and it should be measured. So engagement means different things to different students. So, um, so it's important to pay attention to class participation, to assignment completion, and even to um, track just the time that students are on track in their assignments and assessments. And, and 
I think one thing that's really emerged over these past 14 months is that technologies like, like ours, like class, can, can really help track and facilitate these items either in or outside of the classroom. So on that note, let's bring in our panel. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see their faces. So Janice, Danielle, Lauren, thanks again for being here. We appreciate it. I'm going to, um, to start by having each of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little about, bit about the work you do and the institutions that you're coming from. Um, let's start this out with Janice. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And it's a good morning for me because I'm from San Diego, California. I am the California State Director for the National Center on Education and the Economy, as Kim mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and what that means is that I am the person who leads the development and implementation of partnerships with school districts and county offices of education across California who partner with our organization to what I like to say quite simply change the face of education here in our state, along with many states across the country. Um, so I am uh, excited to come to this conversation with that hat and that lens, and I'm looking forward to sharing some um, thinking around systems and how we think about learning loss. Uh, and I will also share that my background, I'm a special education teacher. Uh, I've, I've worked in both a private and public sector with kids with really severe disabilities and eventually spent some time at the public school in the public school arena as both an assistant principal and then a middle school principal and a high school principal. So that's my background. All of that happened uh, in a district outside of DC on the East Coast actually. So, so that's what I bring to the table today and I'm looking forward to sharing. Thank you, Kim. Great, thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are um, in our country. Um, my name is Lauren Young. I am the Director of Mathematics K-12 for the Philadelphia School District. So myself um, and my team, we support um, over 215 schools across the district with uh, mathematics instruction. Um, we service over 120,000 students. Majority of our students identify um, about 73% as um, students of color. Um, in our communities and our families, over 166 languages are spoken by um, our students and their family across the district. So um, we love our work um, and we have a lot of work to do. And our, my primary focus um, with support of my team is providing um, our teachers and our students with the tools to engage in rigorously aligned mathematics instruction that is culturally and linguistically inclusive. Um, our push is to ensure that all students graduate college and career ready with those tools and resources that they need to either go directly into a college or university or go into a trade, um, but really giving students the choice and the opportunity to decide what their futures hold um, as early as pre-K. Um, so that is, this is me, oh, we're, what have I done in the past? <laughs> Um, I um, was a Teach for America core member, um, and I've taught in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, New York, New Jersey, and back home in Philadelphia, where I'm from. Um, and I'm a mother of four, so we're going to be in Philly for a while. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Danielle. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm Danielle Jastro. I am a licensed school counselor in... Minnesota, so I'm representing the middle of the country, I guess, here. Um, uh, I work in Richfield Public Schools, which is a first ring suburb of Minneapolis Public Schools. My high school is about 1,100, 1,150 or so students. Um, this year I'm working with all of the seniors. So I've got about 240 students on my caseload. Uh, we have, we're about 44% Latinx students, um, about 60% of our students are free reduced lunch, 16% special ed, 16% EL, and over 25 languages are spoken in our um, school district. Um, I've been a school counselor since 2003. Most of my career I've actually spent working with a nonprofit and have supported the Minneapolis Public School District. Um, and spent most of my time um, within there. So I've done um, work with uh, Minneapolis Public Schools and actually helped to create um, a graduation uh, requirement called My Life Plan, which is a post-secondary planning graduation requirement. 
Um, and my work here is really focused around helping students to support or helping students to figure out their plans for life after high school um, and figuring out whatever that next step would be, uh, whether it's to your college, for your college. We define college as any sort of training or education after um, school. So really figuring out what that next step is and having them um, prepared and empowered to take that step. Great. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for the diversity and um, of perspective on, on this panel. So looking forward to this discussion. And let's start out with just, um, just kind of a general um, overview question. And Lauren, let's start with you um, on this one. How have you uh, seen learning loss impact various populations of students? And that could be over the past year, over the past few years. Any trends that you've seen? Um. How we've seen learning loss impact students, um, specifically here in our district, is when students are in high school and they have those opportunities to um, take advanced courses or enroll in specifically math courses that are grounded um, to give that foundation for, for STEM in the future, we, found, we see a decrease in students participating in those courses. Um, we also see teachers um, wanting to close the gap that the, the learning loss that has occurred. Um, and then we find that not enough time is spent on grade level instruction. So that gap continues to widen for our most vulnerable students, our L's, special education students, and our minority students of color. Um, we work diligently to address how do you effectively address the, the gaps that we see in student learning as they matriculate through. Um, and really try to provide those resources so that when a student is a freshman in high school, they are prepared to and feel confident taking English one and algebra one. Um, and they have that self-esteem to move forward into higher, we would say higher level math courses um, that give them more opportunities and exposure to um, progress outside of the 13th year. What does that look like? Are we college? found or are we trade school or whatever the choice is that our students want to make, we really want to ground it in them having the ability to make that choice. Mm -hmm. um, currently, what we're noticing is because of graduation requirements, some students are struggling with graduating in four um, because the, the, the challenge with passing standardized tests and that um, over time becomes frustrating for our students and it's frustrating for our teachers. Um, so that's pretty much how we've seen learning loss impact huge populations of students. Mm -hmm. um, in our city, majority of our students, I had shared earlier about 73% um, Hispanic, Latino, African American. So a, a significant amount of our population of students are already vulnerable and continue to be more at risk when we think about the, what has occurred this past year um, with learning loss. Um, with those students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Danielle, um, I'm also going to pose that question to you. Um, what, what, kind of, what have you yeah. seen as far as learning loss in your students? Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, similarly, um, I think with most of my experience has been with working with high school students. And one of the things um, I find a lot of my students are struggling with is just the amount of additional responsibilities they're facing outside of the school day and um, family obligations. A lot of my students are working to help support their family um, and take care of uh, siblings or take care of other family members. Um, so even they, they share the same motivations to take those higher level courses, they wanna do those pieces and, and to get caught up um, but really even trying to offer some of those um, opportunities to fill in the holes or to get them to get them to where they need to be, the, the time and the energy for them to, to get caught up and get to where they need to be, they just don't have that available. Um, there's really no support outside of the school day. Um, families are working, families are taking care of, of their stuff at home as well that um, it's really hard for them to kind of be able to plug in. So um, in talking to my students, um, as we kind of looked at, you know, what's going on and 
how they're struggling just to kind of keep up with their classes now. Um, you know, I have kids who are like, yeah, I haven't been going to class because I, I have to help my brothers and sisters get on and do distance learning there. Um, so they're, you know, they're falling further and further behind because they're trying to keep their siblings up to date, whereas other kids are, you know, doing whatever they need to do and they don't have those additional obligations on them. So I think um, that's just a whole nother layer um, of responsibility that our, some of our students are facing that um, really puts a, a challenge on what they're what they're trying to do and another layer of responsibility and ad adulting um, that they're facing as yeah, as teenagers. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and Janice, I know you have kind of a unique view from where you're at on, on learning loss and and even just the trends of learning loss over over the years. So wondering if you could comment a little bit on, um, on the impacts that you've seen from, from your level. Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. I really value what both Lauren and Danielle started us off with because um, in both cases, we're getting a really kind of in-person glimpse, if you will, of what our kids are going through. And of course, likewise, what our educators are going do, through to support them. For Lauren's, from Lauren's perspective, I, I love that out of the gate, she put on the table that they're looking at um, learning loss, of course, but also considering that in the scope of the conversation we've had for decades in this country around achievement gaps, if you will, and there's all kinds of terminology we can use for that. Um, and, and that the learning loss conversation now really has to be in the context of that, not separate as if it's something new. And Danielle added to that, that uh, we're looking at the social emotional impact of kids because we're seeing kids with all these additional responsibilities that prevent them from accessing their own learning and, and the last example around older kids having to support their younger siblings and and the, the it ties to what Lauren said because that's not new either we've mm -hmm. always had kids who had those struggles at home what's very different from our lens is that we can see it now right we can actually see it we can be in their homes and see it happening and as a result of that as a as a k-12 community we have to consider then um, how we begin to support that however it also extends us to think about how much this isn't just a k-12 community problem how much this is a community problem so i think about the community that lauren's in in philadelphia the k-12 district schools in philadelphia can't solve that problem right that becomes a community issue that com that becomes a uh, an, a a process or it begs a process where we bring community stakeholders across the the area together to say how do we begin to support this so, so I thank you for bringing both of those points up, ladies. I think that was important. From a learning loss perspective, st stepping back, we're very much the organization that I uh, represent here today, the National Center on Education and Economy, has spent decades doing research around high-performing systems around the world, um, specifically because for at least the last three decades, there's been a, a growing sense of urgency um, around the fact that our kids have been slipping further and further behind. That's not new. What's new is that the pandemic has created an urgency among all of us, parents, community members, businesses, schools, et cetera, around this idea. So what's new is that we're all paying attention to it, uh, which is powerful because quite frankly, educators have had this growing sense of urgency for a long time, getting other people to pay attention to it and recognize that even though your kid seems okay, that doesn't mean that we're not slipping behind. What we know is that all of our kids in general are two to three years behind their counterparts in systems around the world, um, which means that our kids who have to compete globally are already at a disadvantage. And that was true before the pandemic. So when I think in terms of our conversations around learning loss and for the first time ever having this huge influx of money that's historic in nature, um, it's a really important moment for us to step back and not just look at the last year, but to dig deeper than that. Lauren started talking a little bit about kind of figuring out what's at the root of it, right? But to dig deeper than that and to look across a span of years at a school level, at a district level, and begin to dig into the root cause behind what has caused our kids to fall further further behind, especially certain groups of kids, kids of color, kids who have a second language, kids who have special needs, et cetera, and begin to think in terms of that root cause, or root cause is rather, and begin to develop a systems level view of how we begin to then um, de design a system that will meet all of those kids where they are. Tom Friedman uh, talks about it 
and his research. And he says that we have, he at the time actually uh, years ago said we had two gaps to fill. We have to get our lowest kids in this country up to average. We have to get our average kids up to the average of their counterparts around the world. What the pandemic did was layer a third level. And that is the kids who were um, even more impacted by this pandemic up to where they were before and then moving forward from there. Perfect, I love that. That's the perfect note to, to wrap that up on. Um, thank you so much. I, um, I mentioned too earlier that, um, you know, academics aren't, real, aren't the only part of um, learning loss, the, the only component of it. There's definitely an SEL, social emotional learning um, part of this. And what is that impact? What is the SEL impact of, of the pandemic and everything that, that students have been going through? Will there be a loss of social, emotional, and even um, 21st century skills maybe that is happening? Um, and then, um, you know, how do, we, how do we address that? What are those skills? Um, where do we go from here? Danielle, let's start with you on that one. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about it um, with the, the explosion of social media, right? I mean, I talked with college reps who said, kids don't even know how to ask me a question. They just come up and they, it's like, it's a text and then they, they don't know how to say goodbye. They don't know how to greet me. Um, but with social media, even if you watch group of kids, they'd, they'd hang out together, even if they were all on their phones, they'd be, you know, they'd be at least be able to be around one another. Um, so in some ways they, it seemed like they maybe were kind of primed for this kind of a thing, um, but really, really not at all. So um, we're seeing um, more hospitalizations than we have before, um, anxiety and depression through the roof. Um, I think about the transitions, uh, the big transitions, I mean, depending on what kind of system you're in, the, you know, the, the five to six, the eight to nine, um, transitions where kids are switching schools and being in a new school next year we'll have ninth graders and 10th graders who maybe have never been in our building before and what that looks like um, and the anxiety the the normal anxiety that comes with that transition kind of amped up um, we've been we've done kind of four versions of school this year um, and when we came to, with our most recent where we have kids in person we had kids we had a kid have a panic attack in the car uh, with his mom waiting to get into the building. So being around people and the anxiety of, um, of what does it mean to be exposed to uh, a deadly virus and um, what does that look like? Uh, and the worry and the fear of, of that reality when um, developmentally our students aren't prepared for that. Um, you know, you have developmentally our students um, definitely don't think like that, right? They're, fear, they're pretty fearless um, where they're going and what they're doing. And, and when, you tr when you think about, especially our, our younger students, um, they're in no position to kind of, to think through those things. So um, a lot of the, how do we talk to, um, how do students talk to one another? How, how do they student, if you will, mm -hmm. in a classroom? How do they um, interact and, and work with their peers and so forth? Is, uh, it's, it's, there's going to be a lot of relearning um, with those sorts of things and a lot of anxiety. So yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of focus that has been put on. Um, and I mean, even leading up to this, there's been an increased awareness that we need to be more, much more purposeful in teaching these skills. Um, before, like in, in some ways we've talked about, um, you know, almost through osmosis or observation, kids would learn how to take notes or kids would do. And then we kind of realized we actually need to teach kids this stuff. Like if we want them to know what it means to be empathetic, if we want them to know what it means to do, we actually have to be pretty specific in, in teaching these things. So those pieces had started already and now it's becoming um, much more explicit in what we're doing. Um, we've spent a lot of time in our building. Um, actually, we have, we have 45 minute advisory times um, and once a week at our um, high school level, we have advisory lessons on social emotional learning and they're largely put together by our social workers take a lead on those lessons. And they're largely, um, I mean, self-care things 
um, calming, you know, everything like giving yourself grace and understanding how this is not normal and, you know, all of those pieces and just teaching kids that it's okay and how do you process these things. So um, I think we're starting to, we're, we're starting, we like as, as a student support services and the counseling and the social workers, um, this is something we've kind of been trying to scream for a while. Like this is real. Um, our kids are facing this. We need more of us. There needs to be more social emotional support across the board. Our kids are stressed out when they're taking all of these higher level course coursework. We're putting all the stress on our kids. Um, this is a very real situation. And you know, um, when you when you if you think all your counselors are doing are changing schedules and and adjusting things, I mean, please know that that's not the case. Um, there there's a lot going on with kids beyond just that and and there are professionals in your building that are trained to support them and to walk them through so um, there's more that needs to be done more mental health um, professionals more social workers more counselors um, so as as we look at this uh, talking about how do you start to build this in um, to your day I think one of the things um, Lauren had mentioned and um, was being purposeful about about building things into her math lessons. We, we, we had been talking before we started um, building some SEL into math. And one of the pieces we've we've looked at too is how do you start to make it be a part of the day? So our answer to that has been um, through our advisory lessons. It's not this, this one-off thing. It's something that we do. It's something that we talk about. It's something that happens across the building. It's it's not only the gym teacher, it's the chemistry teacher, it's this is something that everybody does. And it's not something that you go to that room over there to talk about. It's a universal conversation. So um, definitely continuing to build those up and continuing um, pre K 12 to have those conversations. Um, on the post K or the post secondary side, I know colleges are also having that. Um, and seeing a lot more of that too and trying to figure out how do they continue to support. So as I work specifically with seniors and dealing with that transition, not only the, the again, quote unquote, normal anxiety that comes with that transition to college, but also the additional anxiety of the pandemic and not being as prepared and what does that all look like? So, I mean, it's really, we have to really wrap our arms around and, and figure out how do we do this um, in a vertical aligned way to support our students, to keep them as healthy as we can. Absolutely, absolutely, being deliberate, I like that. Um, Janice, what have you seen, um, or what are your thoughts even on the impact of, of SEL and 21st century skills in, in kind of that umbrella of learning loss? Sure, so I really appreciate um, everything that Danielle said, especially Danielle, I love hearing that your high school has advisory and it's something that, you know, it has been around for a long time. It's not new, but it's usually a, something that gets a lot of pushback when you try to implement it at a school, right? People don't see it of, uh, having any value. A silver lining, if you will, to this last year is that now everybody knows we need that time. As you said, we have to be intentional about how we teach these skills. And so hopefully that means for schools that it won't be as difficult to begin to implement those kinds of things in the future. Um, and I'm going to add to Danielle's reflections by saying um, the other piece that we're really focusing on right now, because we're seeing these trends as well, are the social emotional needs of the adults, right? There's a lot of research that shows that we're going to have to address the social emotional needs of teachers and leaders and even parents if we're going to be able to support the kids, that we can't uh, support the kids in isolation because our, our teachers and our, our people in our schools and our families have all been through trauma in the last year. Most folks have not come through the pandemic without some form of traumatic experience. Um, and lots of times the teachers who are very much trying to juggle all this new environment and a uh, new way of teaching and learning with kids are also the same people who have a spouse who's out of a job or God forbid, you know, have somebody close to them who died or what have you. So thinking about the social emotional needs of our adults is going to be really important. And, and considering that maybe it's not that we have to teach the things that Danielle outlined for kids, but we do have to support adults and think in terms of uh, what we can do for them to meet them where they are emotionally so that they can better meet the needs of kids. Um, and, and I'll say, as I'm listening, Kim, to the conversation, I'm going back to the four considerations that you outlined in the beginning for us. 
and the social emotional needs of, of, of kids and how by not supporting them, of course, then we are going to uh, continue to negatively impact learning loss, et cetera. Kids need to be ready to learn, right? And we get at that through supporting their social emotional needs in part at least. Um, but as I think about the four considerations you outlined, what I think it all comes back to for me, any one of those four comes back to high quality teaching. Right. It comes back to having a high quality teacher in every classroom. And in this case, we're talking about some very specific ways that we need to build teacher capacity to meet these unique needs we're talking about. The social emotional needs of kids, for example, just because we create an advisory and I'm sure Danielle can uh, absolutely attest to this and we put an adult in each classroom doesn't mean that each adult is prepared and ready to meet kids where they are on that in that front. Right. So building the teacher capacity of uh, ability capacity rather of teachers to do that work across all four of your considerations and uh, building their sense of efficacy, right? Um, more than ever, I think one of the things that we're seeing with adults, um, much like we did with kids, when kids first got into distance learning, we realized how not independent they were, right? That as much as we see, it felt like they were independent in classrooms, once we got them in this environment, we realized, wow, they, really, they rely on the adults to tell them every single step of the way. And that's something we've learned that we have to begin to, uh, you know, to kind of undo, if you will. But likewise with adults, the, the, the pandemic has changed the context of a teacher or a counselor or a principal every day. Every day I opened my email and got a new answer to the same question, got a new set of things that I had to do different today than I did tomorrow, et cetera. Um, and as a result of that, we, we see that teachers and leaders are frozen a little bit, right? Like now, now we're all kind of going, just tell me what to do because mm -hmm. seriously, I don't think anybody really knows what to do, right? And so because of that, I think we have to build, we have to work a little bit on the efficacy of the adult as well. And by doing that, then for me, that means when you build the efficacy and the capacity of the adults, they in turn then can support the kids at the levels doing the kinds of things Danielle outlined that we're going to have to see done in order to ensure that kids don't lose more ground moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Lauren, I know you touched on this a little bit in your, um, in your opening kind of statements, but I would love to hear more about what your thoughts are on, um, you know, from, from the perspective of an, an academic leader and in, especially in mathematics, um, you know, what are you seeing as the impact, the SEL and 21st century impact and, um, and what can we do? And if, even if you want to elaborate on what you've already said um, about that. Um, absolutely. I wanted to um, just also second um, Janice and Danielle's points because so many of that resonated with what we're seeing here. And um, I think as adults, we I keep hearing um, a lot of language around our students are resilient, our babies are resilient. They are, but we also can't take advantage of how powerful and how resilient our students have been. Um, there have been there's families and, and babies that were excited to go to kindergarten and have not stepped foot inside of a kindergarten classroom. There's children that went to school one day in March and saw their teacher and their friends and they have not been back in that space. Um, and that is and has been very traumatizing. As a parent, I've seen how that has taken a toll on my children. Um, and my partner and I, we have, we're nervous about what the, the, the new norm is going to be and how will our children acclimate to that. Um, and Janice, I think you made a really great point about um, the teacher and the adults. Like we need care so that we can ensure that our full glass is there for our students. They have been, they're making history. Um, this has never happened before and they are our history makers. So everything that we do and how we operate um, is going to predict what their road and what their future looks like. So if we're not able to give from a full glass from ourselves, um, our students, when they return or whatever the new norm is going to be, they're going to be the ones who are um, impacted by that. Um, our students have seen political unrest. They have, um, many of our, our, our children are, are, are afraid um, because we, as adults, um, this is new to us and we don't have answers. And we have a level of anxiety and stress that our students um, and our children can see and they can sense and they have a lot of questions. So has our district come up with the perfect package of how to respond to that? Um, no, um, I don't think anyone has, but I think as adults, it's really time for us to be collaborative across the district, across classrooms, across schools, across the country. Um, to hear what's happening in Rich, Richfield Public Schools, that gives me an idea of what we can do with our 54 high schools in our district. 
Um, it really is a time for us to break down those barriers and say, what are you doing and what is working? Because that's the only way we're going to find answers to addressing a lot of the questions that we have as adults so that we are more prepared to serve our students and to serve our families. Um, our students um, have witnessed and have a lot of questions around why are some going to school? Why are some not? Why do I need to wear a mask? Why this? And then teachers too are having those same thoughts and same feelings. So again, we haven't come up with a recipe that we know is going to be the most effective. I can see that we are putting efforts into ensuring that the SDL um, is integrated in within our curriculum and within our lessons and within our curriculum units because we are also cognizant of time. So not every school um, and not every teacher has 45 minutes to just sit and provide that space, but really being purposeful and strategic around the resources that we provide for students that can be a gateway for those conversations to so that students have that platform to ask questions. Let's take a look at a, uh, a, a COVID graph uh, and, and let's talk, just do a notice and wonder in math. Um, instead of picking up Beowulf and starting on page one, let's pick up another text that really starts to engage our students around what and why certain things happened this past year across our country. So they have some more context and background knowledge to answer some of their own questions, but also know that this is a space where now I can ask my teacher this question that I've, I've had, I've seen it on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, and I, I, I want to get more understanding and I want to, I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the attempt and the route that we, we would like to provide for our teachers. Um, maybe next year we'll come back and we can tell you how effective it was. But for me, I think um, from an educator standpoint, we have to be extremely purposeful mm -hmm. around how we move forward. If we try to go back to the old way, and Janice pointed it out that the pandemic was like ripping a Band-Aid off of a bullet wound, we realized how not dependent, independent our students are. Um, thank you, pandemic, for that. Mm -hmm. But knowing that we can't go back to how we delivered instruction before, we have to think of a switch and, it, and it's gonna be creative and we're making history. And as the adult, we get to define what that looks like for our students moving forward. Absolutely. We are making history 100% and, and the resilience has been outstanding. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, summer programming and, um, and how maybe we can expand it be, beyond just credit recovery. And, and I'm seeing summer programs popping up um, all over the country that, that are are looking at more of the basics. They're not just for credit recovery, they're opening to more and more students. So, um, so aside from that credit recovery, how can schools and districts address learning loss over the summer? And, um, and Lauren, I'm gonna come right back to you on that one, if that's okay. Um, sure, um, so I, I struggle with the idea of learning loss because it assumes that learning occurred the first time in order for students to lose it. Um, so when we think about summer, learning acceleration, learning recovery, really focusing on, for the math side, I'll start with math, or what are those foundational focus skills that a student must show mastery and must be exposed to? And what are the connections that must happen for a student to be successful in the grades to come? When I think from the literacy perspective is what are those foundational skills in literacy that a student must need to either be on grade level or to maintain on grade level um, proficiency. Now, um, should only students based off of a diagnostic be allowed to go to credit recovery or, or summer um, exploration or whatever the language is that your district or state might be using? Um, I personally think it should be open to all students um, because again, we service students and their families and they all should have equal access to high quality learning. Um, if it's going to be virtual one-to-one, -one, like let's ensure that those families and students have those resources. If that's not the case, what are we doing for those additional families who don't have the access to the technology? And then thinking from a parent's perspective, what about those resources that we're sending home with students or engaging with students during the day that is enough for a parent to continue to support at home? 
Mm -hmm. um, very often, and I was at fault at this when I was a teacher, I assigned a lot of homework because that homework's going to fix everything. So I didn't finish it during the day. So just go home and, and, and do all of the work. Um, and this is when I was teaching in LA and a lot of my parents didn't, first language wasn't English. All of my directions were in English. My exemplar was in English. So then I'm not surprised why a lot of my students didn't finish their homework. So thinking more inclusive around the families that we serve and what is a respectable lift if a student is not going to be able to attend um, a physical building for your summer recovery or summer acceleration and they're going to be at home. Do they have access to technology in order to engage? And if we're sending home packets or worksheets or whatever it is that you're able to do to ensure access, how are parents, what resources are we going to give to parents to continue to support their child at home so this relationship doesn't become one of frustration? Because our parents are already high level stress and our students are also high level and, and stress and there's anxiety. Um, and I go back to our, our, our children, our babies being resilient. Um, they want to do well. No, I, I can't think of one person who doesn't want to be acknowledged for working hard. Um, and sometimes that translates differently when you're at home and you're one of six and mom is trying to, to get dinner ready and you really need help on number seven or you really need someone to help you edit and revise your essay. Um, and I think that is something to just be a little bit mindful of. So I think um, it should be, everyone should have access to it. Um, of course, there should be priorities. Some of our um, most marginalized students and families should be highly encouraged, um, but at the same time thinking about all students have experienced some um, learning gaps or some unfinished learning that needs to be stamped and solidified for them to matriculate successfully to the next grade and not overlooking those students um, in, in that selection process. Great. Um, and I know that we're, we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to hop to the next question. Um, but if, if Danielle or Janice, you have any anything to add to that, feel free to wrap it into this one. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the tools and, and techniques and, and even the hardware and software that can be used um, throughout the summer into the next school year to um, to address um, maybe learning differences, maybe, um, you know, personalized learning in some ways and just kind of accelerate that, that process. So, um, so really, you know, and, and also, I guess, with the, um, you know, the ESSER funding and, and GEAR funding coming out and, and available, and we're seeing tons of, of districts spending it on technology and hardware and software. So what tools have you seen? What tools do you feel will be useful um, kind of as we move forward throughout the summer and into next year and, and really set the stage for um, a digitally connected um, educational experience for students? And let's start with Danielle. That's a great question. Um, so I can obviously speak to what, what we use here um, in terms of what we have. Um, so we use um, an L, uh, a learning management system called Schoology. Um, so that's one of the tools that uh, our, our students are, are, and teachers are using to communicate um, with that. Um, and I'm not sure kind of how it fits in, but one of the things that um, that uh, I've seen that's kind of interesting is, and I don't know if it's considered lab management software. When I worked in Minneapolis, that's kind of how it was referred to, but the uh, program called Go Guardian. So as teachers are teaching, um, they can be on uh, a program called Go Guardian so they can monitor kind of what kids are doing. Now, as we kind of talked about, if the kids aren't logged in, <laughs> they're not there, you know, it only works if kids are logged in, but, um, it's been one of the ways that we've tried to do interventions on our side as well, um, from the student support side. So uh, when I when I've been working with kids who um, aren't engaged or, or aren't kind of showing up or aren't turning things in and, and have a bunch of, of fails across the board, I can log in and I'm seeing a kid who's supposed to be in math and they're online gaming. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to, you know, pop in um, and redirect um, the, the student to class and hopefully get them to where they need to go. Um, 
I think one of the things that um, and we've, we've addressed it a bunch here is, is that personalization and that connection. So typically I think it's it's challenging and, and as we've talked about um, kind of the summer things, I've had this ongoing conversation slash argument in my head about um, this year's been a battle. I mean, starting it's, this year's been the longest decade that I've lived, it feels like, right? Um, started back last March and um, our, it feels like every day has been a, a battle just to kind of get through and keep pulling our kids through both as a parent and as, a, as an educator. Um, so I know that I'm looking at my calendar. I know that my own children are looking at the calendar and kind of waiting for summer and waiting for that break. Um, so I feel like it's this fine kind of line that we are dancing. Um, with how much do we push them into continuing to work during the summer um, and give them a break and, and let them kind of take that time to, to re, uh, refresh and, and relax. So one of the things I think would be um, an interesting piece is as, as we talk with teams is how do we set up, um, you know, less frequently, obviously, than what happened in school, but maybe occasionally, like a couple of times a month, where we have these sessions that we can kind of bring kids together. Um, from my perspective, obviously, it would be more post-secondary planning related or um, study skills related or like kind of those so, uh, social emotional skills related transition skills um, and, and just be available to talk to kids and kind of do online like sessions. Um, we talked about going to kids and, and really meeting kids where they're at. So rather than always being here in the building um, or even having kids be um, in their places, like is there a park nearby? Um, is there a park near the school um, that they can kind of take advantage of? So trying to, to think outside the box and maybe make it be less school um, because we do have that flexibility of summer um, and go from there. Sounds good. And Janice, what kind of tools do you think will be useful through the summer and into, into the future? I think that uh, first and foremost going there, and I appreciate the chance, I'm gonna add a couple of thoughts to the summer piece in general, but Excellent. starting with the tools, uh, Kim, I think what's gonna be really important is uh, reminding ourselves of what did work this year. Because one of the huge things that happened this year is that our families had more access than ever before to what was happening in the classroom, what was happening at school, uh, from everything to from PTO meetings to being on school site teams to having a conversation with your child's teacher, even if you're at work, uh, you know, uh, on shift work and you're in your, uh, you know, at your employment place of employment, we created more access than ever before. And so I think the tools you're talking about for me um, have such a significant impact on our conversation around equity that I think we have to, um, and I think we're gonna have to remind ourselves because I think it's gonna be real easy to get comfortable with, oh, thank goodness we're back in person. Oh, mom, can you come in and meet with me? I wanna talk about you know, your child. Um, and I think first and foremost, we have to be very clear about now we actually have the opportunity to stay and to use the tools. And I'm thinking about, of course, tools like class because uh, your, your design is around not just classroom instruction, but all of those pieces. Uh, but to be able to say to a parent, hey, let's chat, what, what do you prefer? Should we hop on, right, the, the Zoom or should we, you know, call or should you come in or what have you? So access for me with those tools is going to be huge. And that's true, of course, also for kids. It's also true for the adults in the school system, right? Gone are the days where we need to... Um, drag teachers away from their site to do a two hour training and they have to give up a day and now my kids with a sub uh, because now they should be able to step into a workroom hopefully and do a two hour training virtually and go back into the classroom and not have to uh, again give up a day of learning with their kids who they know best. So that's some of the ways from a big picture perspective I see those tools. When I back up and think about the summer piece, um, and, and again, the tools are going to be really critical here, but whether we're thinking about in-person learning around those ESSER funding for learning loss, or we're thinking about virtual learning, um, I think one of the really interesting things that we're discovering is that um, the, the adults are exhausted. And so, for example, our organization launched a uh, membership organization for superintendents called the Alliance last fall. It was something we've been planning for years, but we accelerated it because we knew superintendents needed more support right now. And one of the conversations we had in a small network group of soups from across the country the other day revealed that they can't get teachers to sign up for summer school 
even when they offer to pay them more because they're exhausted, right? So all of that leads to um, something that I would encourage. And that is think about your summer school opportunities um, and not relating them to, to advancing cognitive uh, growth. The fact of the matter is we're not making up for learning loss this summer. We're not. We're not doing it in a four week or six week, three hour a day program in person, out of person. Drilling math skills this summer, dr drilling reading skills this summer, that is not going to catch kids up. Let's spend the time engaging them again on that social emotional front. Let's spend the time getting them happy about school again and happy about life. Let's spend the time helping them recover some from the trauma that they've experienced. I think that's going to you're going to find that more bang for the buck when they get back in the fall then, right? Um, because they're going to be more ready, if you will, to do school, so to speak. But likewise, the adults, it's a lot less pressure on the adults to have to plan for that. And quite frankly, it begins to do some patching for their social emotional needs. Um, mm -hmm. And then what I like to think is that as a result of that, especially for our leaders, we can free them up to find the lost kids. We lost a lot of kids this year. I haven't worked with a district yet that can't talk about the number of kids they have who disappeared and they mm -hmm. can't find them. And so that would also free up for the summer, some adults who can focus on knocking on doors and finding lost kids and re-engaging them back in the mm -hmm. school and determining what it is they're gonna need to do that, right? Because just mm -hmm. saying we're gonna be back in person and sending out a schedule does not mean those same kids who've been gone for a year are gonna show up on your doorstep in August. And then lastly, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to share that a couple of weeks ago, um, our former CEO, Mark Tucker, uh, posted a blog for us. And the, the name, the title of the blog, I encourage people to go look for it at nce.org, is the American Rescue Plan Act, The Wrong Debate. And he says a lot of really powerful uh, things in there. But one of the quotes I'll, I'll share with you, he says, but make no mistake, throwing money at the problem is not investment. It will be investment only if this moment is used to change and modernize our education and job, job training systems root to branch. So I share that because I know we have to focus on learning loss. I know we have to focus on summer because that's your most immediate pressing thing for all the people in our audience today. Um, but bigger than that is really stepping back and thinking about, and, and I'm gonna come back to what you started this question with Kim, the tools, right? How are we gonna leverage this moment in time to really do a deep contextual analysis of our systems, whether it's a school, a classroom, a district, and determine how we're gonna move forward into the future. And as an aside, I'll say one thing we need help with right now, we're gonna need help getting states of ed, state departments of ed to not close the door on the distance learning environments we've created this year. Because mm -hmm. in a lot of states already, you're starting to see a trend of, no, you can't use distance learning for everyday offering. You, that can only be in those exceptional cases again. And if we revert back to that, that's gonna be a huge fail for all of us. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we had we had an audience question that I, I just want to get to really quickly um, I, because I think it's very important, but I also think it can be, you know, an, an in one sentence answer. So um, as we move forward, we as educators start to, you know, look into next year, start to um, send, send these students home, um, home, um, and, and to kind of refresh and, and, and recover. What advice can we give our parents for how to best support their children academically and socially, emotionally over the summer so that they can return in the fall best possibly, um, best mentally in the best possible mental and emotional space. Sorry about that. So Lauren, let's start with you. Just maybe one or two sentences on that. I will try. Um, we've engaged our parents this year to get through this part this far, and I think we would need to continue to engage our families, um, provide them with the information and access and resources, and most importantly, remember the key word for me and that they're children. Um, children need to have fun. Um, our parents need to have fun. Janice, you already said that that is way more than two sentences, but um, encourage parents to take the time to be with their children because they are children. Perfect, perfect. Danielle. Um, agree, I know we've all spent the last year kind of stuck together. So the idea of, of that, maybe people are looking for a break. Um, be cautious with overscheduling your children. I know we all worry about um, missing out on something and they gotta do this, they gotta do that, or, I, or I'm not doing enough for my kid. Um, but giving your kid a chance to be a kid and, and taking a break and just enjoying 
the summer and but maintaining a schedule it's okay if they go to bed at a reasonable hour that's been one of our biggest challenges um this school year kids who don't sleep so again more than a sentence but there you go that's great and let's wrap it up with janice I'm going to be in lockstep. Uh, as a mom myself, I have a, a almost 14 year old and um, we we did it. We fell right into the, oh, it's March. We have to start looking at summer camps. We're going to be her opportunities. But, and, and, and then I'm also her school's PTO president. And then at a recent meeting, a couple of parents who wanted to know what's are my kids coming to summer school? Because I need childcare, right? They're they're desperate for childcare. So I'm going to go lockstep with Lauren and Danielle and say I had to take a step back and remind myself. You know what? I feel like my kids have, my kid has had a lot of time to hang out this year. Don't get me wrong, but this summer we're going to focus on reading, right? I pick a couple of books at the start of the summer that we're going to read together for the summer, um, and uh, we're going to focus on sleep. Love that, Danielle. And uh, and then we're we're just going to spend time. And um, and and give everybody a break. Perfect. So so important and perfect note to end on. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. I'm going to share one more poll that we have for our audience. But um, as we do that, I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Um, again, this is a really really important um, discussion that we're having. And um, and I know I've seen a couple of questions pop out um, pop up asking to learn a little bit more about class and, and to connect. So um, you can, if you're interested in connecting more with our team, feel free to um, to say yes there on that poll. And, um, and you can learn more again about um, us at class.com. And this um, presentation will also be shared with, um, with you and with anyone who has registered but wasn't able to attend today. So again, thank you to our panelists. Have a great day, everyone, and, and have a great summer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.